Reiner Knizzi has been designing games for more than 30 years, and while you can think of his games in terms of their individual mechanisms, the tile laying trilogy, the auction games, the press your luck games, the games in which victory points also serve as money, the games in which you score in multiple categories and your final score is the lowest of those categories. Those are all recognizable traits in various Knizia titles. But when I think about his entire catalog of work, I think about something that's not a particular game mechanism, but something that runs through most of his game creations. So I think of that in terms of multi-layer actions. And what I mean by that is most games that Kinesia designs give you a few simple options of what to do on your turn. Choose A, B, or C. You are going to do one of those three things. That's it. Typically, those actions are fairly straightforward. Draw a card, play a card, play a tile, do something, pass. All sorts of different things. Make a bid. There's all sorts of different atomic actions that go on, and usually there's a simple consequence or effect from those actions. Either you claim some points, you get something, something you gain ownership, you win an auction, outbidding someone else. There's all sorts of different simple effects that result from those simple actions. But beyond that, there's the repercussions of what you do and how they affect other people and you because most Kinesia games exist where you are all playing in this shared game state, this same world. You don't have your own individual world. That's not something Kinesia usually do, although he's done it a few times with titles like Bits or Connections where you each have your own individual board and you're playing on there. There you're racing to some goal and competing along those lines. But typically, you're in a shared space. You have the same board or the same world or you're competing for some sort of goals where your actions affect everyone else's actions. So you will do something simple but then the next player has to take that into account when determining what to do. Although, of course, they can only do one of those three simple things, but then their action resonates with someone else. And so it's akin to dropping pebbles in the pond where you've got the ripples going out and have all these overlapping ripples, and they make for very different games. So it's interesting to think about how, if you have a game of his like Ingenious, one of those score in multiple category games, all the finished games of Ingenious look the same because you've got a board and it's covered with tiles. They look the same pretty much from one game to the next. But as you're playing the game, they feel very different because of how the tiles get played based on what you have and how you interact with others. Because of course, in that game, as I lay down a tile, I'm increasing often, often increasing the possible scoring potential for someone else. And I have to take that into account when laying down my own tile. Sure, I'm going to profit from what I'm doing, but am I setting something else up so that someone down the line can profit even more? Maybe that's a necessary consequence. You can profit from it, but then you'll close it off and so the other people can't. There's all sorts of repercussions that happen from those types of shared games. Uh, when you think of Samurai or Through the Desert or Tigris and Euphrates or Trendy, trendy for one of his simple designs where that's the whole point of the game is you you all the players collectively you are determining what scores and your choices affect everyone else and it's interesting to see that because you don't get the full experience of one of his games from a single play i talk about this a lot in terms of needing to play games multiple times to really get a feel for them Kinesia games in particular seem to have that where the game is highly affected by what you've done before in previous games because you've seen what happens and now something different happens and things start spinning off in another direction or you play with someone who has not played before and they will do something unexpected even though again you have those three simple actions that's all you're working with and things just spin out of control in a completely different way which was brought home to me primarily by a game of modern art more than 10 years ago with a Korean exchange student we had at the time, Sung Chan, where he played with three people who had played modern art a lot, who had played games with one another a lot. And we played with Sung Chan who made what we thought were just crazy plays, nonsense plays. 
in terms of what he's putting up for auction and what he's bidding. That's all that game is, of course. If it's your turn, you're putting something up for auction. If you're not, you're putting a bid out. That's it. There's not much to it. And yet, he was doing stuff that we just we couldn't fathom why he would be doing that. And then he beat us by some huge score. We were all down here, and he was way up here. And it just pointed out that how you think the game should be played is not always true because it depends on it depends on who's at the table and what actually happens as you take those simple actions. So Kinesi in a lot of ways gives you these basic elements, these gamer DNA building blocks from which you create this experience. They're very basic elements and then they blossom and develop in all sorts of different ways that you would not expect. And I got to see that again while playing Tejudo, a game coming out from French publisher Super Meeple with Abaka Spiele doing the German edition. Luma Games will have the game in English at some point in North America. And it's a two to four player game, very simple. It's a weird style of game because it has a gambling element that I have not seen in any Kinesi design before, at least that I know of. The guy has designed more than 700 games. I have not played them all, so perhaps I've missed something there. But it, it has this gambling element that's new. And it's interesting, of course, to see a guy who's been designing for 30 years with 700 games got this thing that you've never seen before where you're gambling, pulling stuff out of a bag. And yet the game itself feels completely, completely Keynesian in everything else that's going on, starting with three simple actions. Here are most of the components of Tejudo. You have a shared game board upon which players will be building pagodas in eight colors. Here's an example of a completed pagoda. Pagodas have six levels to them, with each of those pieces being separate plastic bits. You have a track for meditation points where you will track how many points you earn during the game, and you will use those points to acquire tiles and to take additional actions. They're not important at the end of the game, though. In that case, you have to worry about spirituality points, which you will gain by buying meditation tiles, by having inauguration tiles for completed pagodas, and for claiming achievements, either during the game or for these two at the end of the game. So. Meditation points are just a tool to get you the spirituality points in the end game. The actions that you are going to take are shown on the tiles that you have in front of you. Everyone starts with these same three tiles. There are, as I suggested in the introduction, three actions possible in this game, and they are depicted on each of your tiles. You can draw a pagoda tile from the bag because nothing starts on the board. Everything starts in the bag. So the bag is broken up with all of the pieces, all 48 pieces in this bag to start with. You can draw a pagoda level from the bag, you can make an offering at a pagoda, and you can acquire one of these tiles. But you start with no meditation points, so you cannot acquire a tile, and you cannot make an offering at a non-existent pagoda. So the only thing you can do initially is to draw a pagoda level from the bag. And you can feel around in the bag, and I can figure out what a base is because I can feel for the steps on the bottom of a base. So I know I can pull out a first level pagoda. And when you have levels in front of you, so whatever I pull out goes in front of me. If during my turn I can play a level, then I must. I don't have to play it immediately because later on in the game you can take multiple actions, but initially, I take this action, it's the only free action I have, I flip it face down, I need four meditation points to take another action, and right now I have zero. So the only thing I can do is play this level, put it here, and I score meditation points equal to the current level of the pagoda that I just placed. In this case, first level, one point. That's it. That's all I got. The first actions are very simple where I just pull a level from the bag. So the next player goes, all I can do is pull a level. Maybe they put out a level one and now blue is on the board too with one point. And it feels like nothing initially, except of course, you don't have to pull a level one out. You can put a level two where this can't be built because you need the base first. So this player now holds on to it. 
at the end of your turn, after having played everything you must play, after having taken any number of actions that you can afford to take or want to take, you can keep at most one Pagoda level. So this player can hold on to this and later on possibly the red base will be in play and then it will be put out. So over the course of the game, many different levels will be built. And of course, if we get back around here, maybe the yellow player now on their turn, since they have the second level sitting in front of them, instead of drawing from the bag, perhaps they want to use their action to make an offering. So you take the cube of the matching color, you place it on the level in this, in this uh, space designated for it, and you earn meditation points, two points for the offering itself and points equal to the current level of the pagoda. So in this case, three points total for the yellow player. Now you've got this second level. Normally when you put a second level onto a pagoda, you earn two points because it's the second level. If you're covering an offering though, you get two points for securing that offering in addition to points for the level. So four points. Yellow is up to seven and acquires this first achievement is the first player to get to five meditation points. The other instant gain achievements get to 10 meditation points, 30 points, which of course means you're going to save them up for a while and not spend them and then probably blow them all at once as you're getting one or more tiles here. You'd be the first to make four offerings. So yellows is in the lead having made one. And now of course it has increased the value of the offering for the next player because the next time you put an offering in, it's two points for the offering and two points because that's the current level. But if you make an offering and you don't cover it, then you're enriching the meditation points for whoever comes after you to cover it later. But there's a limited number of spaces to put the offering. The pagoda is six levels high. You can't make an offering on the top level because that's pointless. It'll get wet in the rain. You must make it on one of the first five levels. So if the pagoda is built up quickly enough, people get locked out, which means it's not possible to get this instant achievement tile, which is be the first to make eight offerings. The final uh, instant achievement is be the first player to complete a pagoda. That is by capping it with the level six piece. So those are the basic actions. You are going to Draw Pagoda tiles from the bag. You must play them if you can at some point during your turn. You can have one hang around your turn for use later. You can make offerings and you can buy tiles. When you buy the spirituality or meditation tiles, you just put them face down in front of you and you score one to five points depending on whatever you buy. And of course the cost goes up if you come later. So the first one over here is two meditation points for one spirituality point and then it's three, and then it's four, and all of these increase as well. Standard Keynesian workings here. For these, these give you additional actions that you can do on your turn. So if I spend 10 meditation points, I put this in front of me, and I can use this tile in at any point to acquire a tile. I still have to spend the meditation points, but it's a free action, and it doesn't take away from my regular free action. So I, then I can do this. I can buy something and I can take an action or take my action first, draw a level, place it, hopefully get enough points to then buy the tile that I want. I can have a free make an offering action and I can have draw a pagoda level action which costs 14 initially and two each time I want to use it. So it has a cost, but it, it's highly useful. Except of course, all of these are highly useful. Hmm. These two tiles, uh, it costs 10 and then in the future every tile I acquire costs two less and there are two of those and I can get both of them and then have four off of all the tiles I buy but I have also spent 22 meditation points for no spirituality points maybe it's helpful maybe it's not hopefully I can make it helpful F final tile this one here if you have this then all of your meditation tiles and all of the inauguration tiles, which I haven't talked about yet, are worth one additional spirituality point. So initially I'm spending 16 for nothing, but then every tile I get after that will be worth one more, assuming that it scores. The inauguration tiles, there's one for each of the Pagoda colors, and on a turn when you buy a tile, instead of buying one of these 10, you can buy the inauguration tile for a Pagoda I put it in front of me. So if the red player buys this, 
they put it in front of them. This is worth zero points. If this pagoda is completed before the end of the game, then it's worth four points. If it's not completed, still worth nothing. The game ends when four pagodas are completed. It ends immediately at that moment. So you are gambling on whether something is going to be completed or not. Okay, that uh, ties in with the final actions. Whoever completes the fourth pagoda gets this, which is worth one spirituality point. And whoever is farthest along in the meditation track gets a point at the end of the game. Uh, reward for doing well. You lost your chance to spend those points to do something more useful, but at least you got one point. You got something. And at that point, whoever has the most spirituality points wins. I played to Judo four times on our view copy from Super Meeple, twice with two players and once each with three and four players. And to Judo is a standard Kinesia design, which might sound dismissive, except I am a huge Kinesia fan, so instead read that as incredibly good. So to Judo is such a good example of what Kinesia does with very simple rules and simple actions available to the players. Because you have three actions available to you, one of them, make an offering, you get meditation points, so you earn some money. You can draw a pagoda level, which maybe you place and earn money, or you just leave it in front of you. Okay, hopefully future money. Some information available to you and to all other players, since everyone can see what they have in front of them, as you continue the game. Or you can buy a tile, which is end game points or possible end game points, depending on whether or not a pagoda is completed, or it modifies an action or gives you an additional action. All simple, all straightforward, and yet the four games I've played have been highly varied in how they play out and what happens during primarily the middle to the five sixth point in the game. Things vary a lot in terms of how they get built and what people invest in, what tiles they buy, and where things go. And then at the end of the game, it's like the situation where you're looking at the ingenious board and it all looks the same because as the games play out, it ends when the fourth pagoda is completed and typically the other four are nearly complete. So it just varies depending on what color is completed at which times. And so it seems like it's somewhat random because the game starts with almost nothing because no one has any meditation points. You can't do anything extra. I can only draw from the bag. And then after starting from the second turn on, maybe I can make an offering which will earn me a few more meditation points. And so you've got these tiny little actions where it doesn't seem like you're going anywhere. You're not building up to do anything. And sure, maybe once you hit four points, oh, I can spend those four points to take another action. But what am I doing with that action? Gaining six meditation points? I did all that just to gain two points? For what? What, is, what am I doing with this? And yet, as the game builds, things start to escalate because everything becomes more valuable. And again, this is sort of like a reference point to Ingenious, but it can you can make reference to almost any Kinesia game for how things play out, where everything starts small and then they escalate over time because you'll start to earn more meditation points where you can take multiple actions together, where you can make an offering and then draw the level and cover that up and earn even more and earn more. And then I have enough that I can buy the end game points. Everything escalates over time because everything becomes more valuable as you're building up the pagoda levels. And at a certain point, as has happened in all four games, you start building things up and oh, I earn four points here and five points here and I wanna make an offering and I'm racing to make the offerings first to get that achievement tile. It's only one point, but one point's better than nothing, especially with winning scores that have ranged, I think from 12 to 16. It's a small range, so every point matters. So you're racing to make those offerings. You're racing to make eight offerings. You wanna be the first to get 30 points. But of course, if you're building up those points, you're not getting, you're not spending them to do anything. What are you gonna do with them later? You gotta make something from them later, which is definitely possible. Often you're scrambling to get just the few points you need in order to keep going. And you keep finding yourself a bit hamstrung by what you do because there's so little available to you in terms of what you want to do. I want to draw a level. Oh, I'm going to take this and I earn. Oh, I got eight points now. Now I can buy one of those inauguration tiles. Oh, but I can't take a second action because the second action cost me four. So I need 12 points in order to do this. So I'll, I'll wait till next turn. And the next turn comes around again. 
and maybe that's the best option maybe it's not maybe someone else bought it before you and so you should have been planning a little further ahead back in order to be able to buy that tile earlier the more that you build up a pagoda the more you make it attractive for everyone to buy that tile and then once someone does you don't want to finish it except if you draw a level that can be played it must be played so you start getting in these weird situations where initially you want things to build. You want other people to build something because you have a higher level in your reserve and you want to play it on top of it in order to profit from that. But they may not want that, so they don't draw the level of tile that you want. And this is where you get into this weird gambling aspect of the game because all the tiles start in the bag. And you can feel in the bag and find the level, the size level that you want but you don't know the color. So you're initially drawing, you can draw the level ones. It's very safe to draw level ones, but of course it's only one point. And maybe you wanna draw level two for your first action, which gives you nothing, but you're gonna get two points the next time that happens, right? And maybe you'll do what that yellow player did in the example and make the offering and then cover it. And so, yes, I'm on the way. Although you enrich the possibilities for other people. Someone can now draw level three on that and they'll get three points off of it. But of course, that's only one in eight pagodas. The other seven, if they draw the other seven level three tiles, they can't do anything with it except hold on to it. But maybe it's worth the gamble. And so you get this weird, not weird, delightful. Let me say that. You get these delightful effects of how things play out, just depending on what players are trying to do and what they're aiming for long term because everything's going along the same path and most everything is available for people to see, except of course, what's going on inside your head. And that's gonna be different for every player as you play out over the game. What are you trying to do? How are you trying to do it? You wanna buy the extra action tiles because it's very good to have the freedom to play those tiles, to have the free offering action. It costs 12 to get, but from that point on, you have the ability to make an offering almost whenever you want, assuming there's a spot for it. And other people will try to build so that there is not a spot for it. Or so that you make the offering, but they're gonna have the level that's gonna cover it, so then they will profit off that as well. Or you buy the tile that lets you buy a tile. Okay, that's great. You wanna be able to just Buy the tile in the meantime. Get those inauguration tiles that you don't have to spend an extra four for so that you can profit from that. And hopefully those pagodas will be completed. But of course, as soon as you buy that, no one wants to complete it. You can get the one to build an extra pagoda level, which is great because you can draw as many levels as you can afford and then build them in the order of your choice that may make a difference depending on what other actions you have or whether you can make an offering or whether you can buy an inauguration tile. So you also may want to draw extra levels so that then you can throw back a level that would help another player and instead of possibly being forced to build it when your turn comes around and you're in that situation where you're forced to build it. So we've seen this as well. There's already Again, in the simple actions with the four games play, there's been a lot of variety in terms of how things have played out and what people have tried to do, buying the extra action tiles, buying the bonus tiles where you get discounts or where you earn extra points, or focus solely on meditation tiles, which are a good way to earn lots of points, but they're costly. Whereas the Pagoda tiles are much cheaper. They cost only eight for potentially four points versus 16 for a definite four points, but maybe you get nothing. It's kind of amazing that Kinesia can do this so many times with so many designs. So Tejudo has something that is very Kinesian in terms of everything about the game other than the gambling, which is an element that I had not seen in any of his designs before. This is a very interesting, funky element. It's weird because, of course, you could have a bag. You could have six bags, one bag for each level of tile. And so that way you know, oh, I want a third level. I go in the third level bag. Because you should be able to feel 
the size of the level that you're getting. And generally you can, and yet we've had multiple people, uh, including me, draw the wrong level. You thought you were drawing a level six and it said you drew a level five, and then there's some repercussions from that. And admittedly, some people might be peeved at that because, wow, I did that by mistake. I clearly wanted it as level six. I, I said so when I started my turn, can I put it back? But it makes these interesting game moments where things just go awry. It's fun. It's an interesting twist on on what's happening, where you've got plans and things to mess up and you have to live with it and just roll with what goes on from there. So I think it's a feature, not a bug, that you potentially draw the wrong size piece from the bag. You can feel for the size you want. What we often do as well is you're going to say, OK, I want to draw this size, and then I hold it up on the edge, and I take another piece that's already out there, and I hold it up. Oh, yep, this is definitely the size I want because I match it right there. Or it's uh, the width of my thumb. Yep, that's the size I want. You can do that if you want, just to be sure of trying the right size. Or you just sort of wing it and you see what happens. It's, it's interesting. It's fun to dig in the bag as well because it just feels good. It's like this magic moment where you think, oh, I want to get one of these. I, I need two, two of six. There's two pieces I can draw out of this size that would be good for me. Yes, that's what I wanted. It feels good. And then when it doesn't happen, how can I recover from this? Can I still make this happen? Can I still do something with this? So it gives these these great feelings and moments from this very simple thing, drawing something from a bag. It's a common game element. And Kinesia does it in a new way here because the value of the levels changes as the game progresses. And so initially you feel the level ones. Okay, I know those, I can draw those out. And as you empty them out, of course, the pieces are much smaller. Initially you don't even notice the level sixes because they're all buried at the bottom of the bag. You're grabbing the big stuff at the top. And then as the game progresses, oh, green's progressing well. I want I want something green. I'm going to take a risk, draw a level five. And you got to work your way past, oh, there's still this one base that no one's played, and there's some level two stuff. i got to push all that aside and dig for the, the tiny things. But that level one is there, and it provides this, this release valve sometimes because there's the things you don't want to have happen, or you want to make that eighth offering. And then so in all four games, we had this one pagoda that wasn't being built, and then finally it's built. And then finally things start solidifying because there's only one level two left in the bag. I know what it is. I can do this definitely. I can put this offering. I know I can calculate how many points I can earn from that, which is going to go with the plan that I want to do in the next turn. And so now it makes sense to do this rather than gamble for the thing that either profits well or gives me nothing. And so... There's all these possibilities within this simple framework. It's kind of amazing. I, I guess I should stop being amazed at a certain point by how well Kinesi is at his job. But he's been doing it 30 years, and he's gotten really good at doing what he likes to do. The only drawback to the game, the only thing that has sort of gone wrong, is that the pieces, while well designed, they stack together and they look beautiful. Super Meeple always does these 3D elements in all of their games, but the pieces sometimes stick together in the bag. So this level three piece sticks in this level one. So as you're feeling in the bag, you pull something out. Well, clearly I wanted this level one. I did not want this level three, so we put it back in the bag. Or a level two can stick in a level three as well. There's some others like that where things stick, but often you're feeling and you're getting the big piece, so we know what you want. Just take the other thing out and throw it back. Small drawback, but that's what you pay when you want 3D pagodas. Yes, sometimes that happens where things stick together. And sometimes you draw the wrong size. And there's some other elements here. But it creates this great feel as you're building and doing things and making the offerings and then they get all covered up. And it just, it all works so well. It works so well for what I imagine Kinesio wants people to have in terms of this game experience. Where you have simple choices available to you, and then they just make this wildly different element. The DNA of games. Kinesio is a master at that. There's an overview of Tejudo.